I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone and thank you all for joining us today for our briefing exploring the policy landscape of carbon dioxide removal. I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And I'd like to start by thanking Senator Peter Welch and his staff for helping us with the room today. And I'd like to say lots of thanks to our partners in presenting this briefing, the World Resources Institute. Uh, this is actually the second uh, briefing we've hosted in partnership with WRI on carbon dioxide removal. Back in April, we hosted a briefing called Demystifying Ocean Carbon Dioxide Removal. And that was focused on advancements in techniques, techniques and technologies for removing and storing carbon from the ocean. As with all of our educational resources, that briefing is free to view if you visit our website, www.eesi.org. We do a lot of briefings. We write a lot of articles. We publish a lot of fact sheets. We produce a lot of podcasts because it's what we do at EESI. We are actually celebrating 40 years uh, of advancing climate solutions through congressional education uh, this year. Uh, we were founded by a bipartisan group of members of Congress, and since 1984, we have worked to provide science-based information uh, about environmental energy and climate change topics to policymakers and the public. But today, our focus is all about the topic of carbon dioxide removal, and we have a very special guest. And before we turn to our panel of experts, it's my privilege to welcome Senator Michael Bennett to our briefing for a fireside chat-style conversation about carbon dioxide removal. Senator Bennett has represented the great state of Colorado in the world's greatest deliberative body since 2009, and you're a committed champion of climate solutions. And if you follow the good news of state-level climate action, you might already know that Colorado is a leader in energy efficiency in buildings, electrified transportation, as well as resilience to impacts like wildfires and drought. And Senator Bennett is a pragmatic and independent thinker driven by an obligation to create more opportunities for the next generation. He has a reputation for working with Republicans and Democrats to address our nation's greatest challenges, including immigration, education, health care, national security, and of course, climate change. And lucky for us, he happens to know a lot about carbon dioxide removal. That's so. not really true. Oh, well. You have a panel of experts, though, that's coming afterwards. We will so. fake it till we make it. Exactly. Um, but Senator Bennett, thank you Thanks very for much having for me. joining us today. No, I appreciate it. It's, thank you, everybody, for the time. Um, so we're going um, to get started right away. Uh, and I'd like to uh, first by, I'd like to start by, you know, just acknowledging that climate impacts are all around us. And Communities, businesses, and researchers all across the country are responding by coming up with climate solutions to address the challenges. Uh, what are you seeing in Colorado and hearing from your constituents about climate change, and how does this motivate you to work on these issues? Well, we're, see we're seeing it everywhere. I mean, in Colorado, we're the headwaters of the Colorado River. In fact, I started today's meeting, or my, my meetings today with a group of senators meeting on the topic of the fact that they're making no more water for the Colorado River. We're in a 1,200 year drought. We're in a, um, uh, a fight, as we often are, between the upper base and the lower base of the river. It's only made harder by the fact that we are in a 1,200 year drought. And um, it's a challenging moment for our farmers, for our ranchers, for our communities, everybody. Uh, in the West lives downstream from um, these forests that are now subject to wildfire in a way that they never have been because of climate change. That means our, our lifeblood, which is the water on the tops of those peaks, the snow on the tops of those peaks, is, is subject to the risk of climate change. So it's not an exaggeration to say that um, this is our lifeblood, this is a, an issue, we use the word existential around here all the time, but it is an existential issue for us. Beyond that is the economic you know, impacts that are I see everywhere with road closures, with mudslides, with, with fires again themselves. And then the question about whether or not we can hold on to our farms and our ranches for another generation. Is there going to be enough water to do what we need to do? Can these communities that rely on decisions that we made 100 years ago about water persist in a, in, a, in, a, in a climate that's continuing to, to get warmer and warmer. And then there are things that may sound a little bit more prosaic, but are really important, like, you know, can our um, ski resorts get insurance, you know, for us to be able to operate? Can we have a long enough season for there to be uh, the, the ski industry that we've relied on so much. So this is not a tangential issue for us. This is an issue that uh, um, uh, confound, co 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 this is an issue that all of us are wrestling with, whether we're Democrats, independents, or 
Republicans, it doesn't matter, and, um, and we know we have to address it. So today, I mean, there's a lot of things we can do for climate change. We can reduce emissions, we can make ourselves more resilient, we can find ways to adapt. But today the topic is carbon dioxide removal. And what is it about CDR that interests you? Why, what is it about it that makes you think it's part of our overall package of climate well, solutions? For, first of all, I think, you know, it's, I don't think we can get done what needs to be done on climate without CDR. The Rhodium report tells us that we've got to, uh, we have to collect about a gigaton a year um, uh, of CDR if we're going to be able to to get to the uh, the targets that we have for mid-century. I, I don't, you know, nobody knows what really is going to happen between now uh, and then and what technologies we're going to be relying on, but it is very plausible to me, as it is to the people that I represent, that if we could figure out a way to caption the carbon dioxide that's already in the environment, that are that's legacy, that le it's legacy uh, carbon dioxide, that we will be much more likely to meet our goals than we will if we don't. And that's why I'm interested in this. I can't prove to you sitting here today that it will work, but I do think um, with American ingenuity, with American innovation, with the um, the the legislative changes that we've already made and commitments that we've already made, that we can begin to think about it and address it and figure it out. And I think as long as we know that we, we've got to take an all hands on deck approach to get to that um, net zero future for carbon, it makes a lot of sense for me that CDR should be part of that. And let me actually add one other thing. You know, I mentioned earlier what the landscape in Colorado looks like in terms of climate. You know, this is the, a fact of life for all of us, no matter what party, party we're in. Sometimes, though, we have a lot of skepticism about the politics in D.C. and whether anybody actually wants to solve the problems or whether they're just raging at each other. And it's been very important to me as a member of the Agriculture Committee to look, because I, I happen to believe that just like CDR, that we're not going to be able to solve our climate issues in a meaningful way if we don't engage American agriculture. We don't engage the global agriculture, for that matter, in that process. And we've been able to work, um, as a member of the Agriculture Committee, with Republican parts of my state uh, to develop legislative ideas that um, are making a difference on the ground. This just last week, we learned that Colorado is getting a billion dollars uh, for our rural co-ops to be able to make the transition that, um, that we all think is essential for us to make. That is an excellent way of beginning to stitch together a bipartisan politics around this. And just, with, just as it's made a difference, I think, for the rural co-ops in terms of making this not just a Democratic only thing, but also extending to Republicans. I think CDR has the same kind of potential as well. You talked for a moment about American ingenuity and innovation. I'd like to come back to that because in my, in my little introduction, I mentioned some of the ways that Colorado is being a leader, but I suspect there's also really interesting things happening in Colorado on carbon dioxide removal. And I'm curious how you see Colorado playing its leadership role in, de in developing an understanding of CDR methods and opportunities. And what do you see in terms of opportunity for carbon dioxide removable deployment in Colorado? We're obviously, I mean, we're like everywhere else, very early stages, but I think there's a feeling that the geography is pretty good and the geology is pretty good for CDR in Colorado. We've got amazing um, institutions like NIST and like um, uh, NREL uh, and the School of Mines that are all working on this project in one way or another. Uh, and then we've got a very robust set of um, entrepreneurs that are working to solve the challenges from hydrogen to CDR to, to and we were obviously very early adopters in terms of wind and solar and early adopters in terms of energy standards that, um, clean energy standards that led the world. The capture of fugitive methane is something that we really developed in Colorado, both as a technology, but also as a, as a, pol pol as a, as a matter of changing policy. So I think in many ways it's a perfect state uh, to experiment with this and to understand it, and I think we will provide a lot of leadership on it, despite my being, no, uh, I think we will. Not despite. Um, 
You mentioned the uh, massive investments in rural electric cooperatives. Uh, there was a big announcement recently about that. Seems like every other day there's a massive announcement from the administration about rolling out the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And it's been a pretty exciting time in climate uh, the, for the last three years. And I'm curious, um, with respect to our ability to make additional progress on climate and clean energy, what do you, what else would you like to see from a federal policy standpoint? Well, you mentioned the, you mentioned the, the, the bipartisan origins of this group, you know, and, and for certain people, um, it's hard to imagine a time when there would have been a bipartisan group of legislators that were working together to try to do something hard. And we're gonna have to get back to that in order to be able to really address this. Look, I don't think we can regulate banking in this country two years at a time. We can't do it. Um, with one Congress coming in and then ripping out what the next Congress does and then the next one coming, the next one coming. We need to have a longer view about that. I mean, we did not win the Cold War two years at a time. Democratic and Republican presidents knew what their job was with respect to the Cold War when they became president. We had differences, sure, and we made a lot of mistakes, but we had uh, in, uh, a way to organize our thoughts over the long view. There, if you ask, there is not a country in the world that is better situated than the United States to attack this climate challenge. There's not one. No one has the energy resources we have that's not a kleptocracy, that's not a, you know, and, 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 and we have, I mean, not only do we have abundant fossil fuels and abundant um, uh, replacement for those fossil fuels, we have the innovation we talked about, we have less corruption than a lot of these co other countries have, we do have, we've got a lot more capital and a lot more innovation, and if we could focus on also the national security benefits and uh, the economic independence benefits for the United States of America of moving off our current um, energy uh, mix onto something that was far more under our control and far better for, for us from an emissions perspective. I mean, I think we'd be surprised not only at how great we felt about our national security and our uh, economic independence, but we maybe actually begin driving salaries and wages up in this country again, which is another piece of what we have to do. All of which is just a long-winded way of saying that, you know, we, there is a patriotic place for us to land on this set of issues that I think can inspire the, a kind of bipartisan politics around this again, even though at the moment that's lacking. And I won't reiterate it, but it is also why in my office we've tried very hard to look for opportunities to reach across the aisle, not just here but at home as well, to try to build a, a, a visible commitment to what this future is going to look like. I mean, I'll just honestly say this. I shouldn't say because somebody's going to get mad at me, Suzanne, maybe. <laughs> but I've never loved the words just transition because I always feel like it sounds like people, it's an afterthought. You know, it doesn't sound like it's core to what we're trying to do. And I think there's nothing more core to the United States than our national security. There's nothing more core to the United States than our energy policy. There's nothing more core to our country than driving wages up, hopefully, and creating an economy that when it grows, it actually grows for everybody, not just the people at the very top. The commitments that we're making on this energy transition and to putting the United States in the position to lead all other countries around the world, which, by the way, the IRA begins to allow us to do, the infrastructure bill begins to allow us to do, and all the innovation that just belongs to the, the, the society that we're all lucky enough to inherit, I mean, that creates an amazing opportunity for us, I think, to coalesce around a set of um, efforts, um, some of which were, are gonna turn out to fail, but some of which are gonna succeed, that I, I'm absolutely convinced by 2050 is gonna make us the place that's able to transmit to the rest of the world the benefit of the technology. I'm not saying we're gonna wait until then, I'm just saying when we want, need to get to that net zero world, we're gonna be far ahead of everybody else. That'll be a good thing for us and I think a good thing for the world. So I'm glad that you um, sort of started looking ahead because we do about two dozen briefings a year uh, and one of my favorite questions to ask our expert panelists is to sort of imagine themselves five years from now. So let's say we were back here five years from today 
what would success look like to you uh, with carbon dioxide removal? What would you like to see in terms of U.S. leadership and policy? What would deployment look like? Um, what would be some milestones and some accomplishments that you would like to see in the next five years? I mean, that would, yeah, I think, know well, I think that it, certainly in the next five years, you'd like it to come off of the bench and uh, into, you know, viable companies across the country that are beginning to, um, to use the technology in a commercial way. You'd like to be able to see the uh, academic work that's been done transferred to the private sector, I think, so that we can get, you know, actually get this done in a commercial way as well. You'd like the Rhodian people to be able to write another report that says we're actually on the way to meeting that target that they're talking about. We won't be at the target, but that it's plausible that we can capture that as well. And I think, uh, you know, I want to say again, I'm not here to say CDR is all that we need to do. It is, one, it is a very, very important complement to the other things that we need to be pursuing. And over those five years, we better make progress on the rest of this stuff too, because you know my daughters, just to pick three people uh, of the next generation, are gonna string us up if we don't actually address the issues that they need us to address around climate, and I think it will, you know, I, I just, I believe, I hope I've tried to express this today that there is a way for us to do this in a way that is really exciting and could maybe promote a new politics around this country. And so I'd hope that would be part of it too, five years from now. Maybe we wouldn't be asking what, what, where we can find the bipartisan support for the work we're doing. Maybe we will have discovered that CDR would have been part of building the bipartisan support that we're gonna need on the broader challenges that we face. Yeah. Great, well, that's a lot in the next five years, but uh, I think we could probably do it. And we have about five minutes or so, um, and I understand that we might have some questions in the audience, so if you're game for a couple sure. questions, I think we probably have time for a couple. What we'll ask you to do is just to ask your question and then I'll repeat it into this microphone so that our live cast can pick it up. But uh, any questions from the audience today for Senator Bennett about carbon dioxide removal? Yes. Thanks very much, Senator, for being here. My name is Andrew Fishbein. I'm with a CDR company called Climeworks. Um, and what you said about the United States being the best place to scale this industry really resonates. Uh, Climeworks is a Swiss-based company, and we're uh, set to scale in the United States based on the policies um, in the infrastructure law uh, in the IRA. So I'm wondering, you know, you, you mentioned kind of patriotism and bipartisanship as, you know, that CDR can maybe actually be um, a hook and a center for, mm -hmm. for building this. Um, one, of the, one of the policies that I think uh, could get some bipartisan support has to do with a, something amounting to a carbon border adjustment. I wonder if you could talk about your thinking there. Um, I'm just gonna repeat your question. So, so you're with a company called Climeworks, you're deploying and building up in the United States, and your question is, uh, as with respect to bipartisanship, could a carbon adjustment border mechanism uh, or something along those lines be one way to attract bipartisan support for the issue? Yeah, I think it's plausible. I mean, obviously these things are incredibly complicated and especially in, in tax areas and in trade areas, uh, there are often unintended consequences that nobody has thought through. I'm sure the Swiss actually do manage to figure out how to, how to think those things through, uh, but, but absolutely. And um, we've had conversations on the Finance Committee about this from time to time, and I'd expect those conversations to continue. Look, there, there, we are, you know, I mean, again, let me say, we're, we're living at a time as a nation, this is um, where we're not seeing the economic mobility that we should see in our own economy. And my, my view of that is that we've had 40 years of, of sort of laissez-faire trickle-down economics that has not worked very well, you know? Um, I say that, by the way, as one of the few people in the Senate who's been in business before I was in the Senate. I mean, I think we've got to figure out how to create a capitalist system again in this country that when it grows, it actually grows for everybody, not just the people at the very top. How we approach energy is a really important answer to that equation, how we think about our global position and how we locate our economy and that competition is really, really important as well. And so I think the kind of thinking that you're talking about is, is actually the kind of imagination we need to be applying rather than imagining that the way we've done it for the last 10 or 20 or 30 years is gonna get us where we need to be. 
from an economic point of view or from an energy point of view or from a climate point of view. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, we have a trade point of view. Sorry. Uh, we have a question in the back. Thanks for your question. The question was about the potential for permitting for reform to help advance carbon dioxide removal. We have to do it, we, and we should want to do it. I'm glad to do it. I think that we are, you know, we're, we're in a, this is a place of political line drawing that is hard to understand back home. I mean, people here draw it, but back home people don't draw it in the same way. I mean, we have to, we have to protect in this country and in this world what needs to be protected. I spent four days in August, you know, 19 miles from the Arctic Ocean. That's a place that should be protected um, and where we should be really serious about, about what the regulations look like and what the protections look like. There's a lot of the room, you know, we need to have businesses be able to form in this country in, a, in an efficient way. We need to be able to approve um, infrastructure in a much, much more efficient way, and um, and I and I and I say that as a Democrat, not wanting to trade something for it. I believe that we should do it, you know, in a way that's responsible. But we should do it, and it doesn't serve anybody's interests. I don't think just to slow things down for the sake of slowing things down. So I hope it will be part of that discussion as well. Great, thanks. I think we have time for one more question. I, I saw your hand there. This is what I mean by uh, by uh, uh, my focus. I, you know, I, I ran a not very well remembered campaign for president, and the and I well, it's true. Like, I mean, no, my mom even I'm her oldest son, and when I told her I was running for president, she said to me, Michael, do we really need a seventh person in this race? Um, which was rough, and I ran. I, I was well, actually watching the debate the other night with, in Cory Booker's office, and I told him, we, you know, that every time I see him, it reminds me that my mom never asked that question about Cory Booker, uh, <laughs> ever, ever. But, 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 if you're really bored, you know, go look at the the policy stuff I put out on climate, and you'll see that it starts with agriculture. And the reason it starts with agriculture is to build the kind of bridges that I talked about earlier and I think soil health globally is going to be a massive part of you know both um, how we create a more sustainable world put climate aside how, how do we create more sustainable agriculture how do we uh, provide the opportunity for generations of um, of people in in our country but also around the world to be able to um, uh, pass on their heritage to the next generation of humans, that's a whole soil health question in a lot of ways. And I think that the opportunity for us to think about uh, how, to, how to achieve our goals for carbon sequestration in that context, I'm very optimistic about. You, the very last part of your question, though, is a really, really important one, which is how do you measure it? And that is what Farmers and ranchers in Colorado want to know. They want to know that there's a credible way of measuring it. They want to know that practices they've been engaged in before but have not been credited for doing somehow are accounted for in, the, in a transition like that. I mean, these are all very reasonable questions, and this is another place where if you meet with the people, not on Capitol Hill necessarily, but the people out in the world that are developing these new technologies, thinking about these new measurements, trying to figure out how to do it, it really does fill you with optimism about the, the future, and, and, I, and I think we're going to find a way to solve it. Those tools, though, are very, very important to being able to 
bridge the chasms that we've been talking about politically and from a policy perspective. And I think every day that goes by, we're getting closer to being able to develop them than we were the day before. We just have to stay focused and we'll be fine. Well, I think optimism for the future is a great place to leave it today. Uh, we understand that we have to share you and you have a lot of Thank other things you. to do today. Uh, busy day, busy month, so good luck. Busy and month, thank you. We really appreciate you Thanks for us having me, I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's really great to meet you. This is me not forgetting my All right, that was fun. We need more fireside chats with United States Senators at our briefings. Um, I'm going to request that our panelists make their way to the front of the room and we will, we said this earlier, we'll light this candle, or the other candle, the panel part of the candle. Um, that was really cool. Uh, and your name cards are on your chairs and we'll get started. Um, so, um, now we're gonna get started. We have four Really excellent speakers. Uh, I'm really excited about, my, my favorite part is this, that I get to listen to your presentations and learn, uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, after our fourth presentation today, we will have some time for audience uh, questions. We're gonna be taking questions from the in-person audience today. Um, if you're in our in-person audience or our online audience, I encourage you to follow us on social media at EESI online. Uh, and we'll also be doing real-time coverage on our Instagram story and X. If you've missed anything, if you want to go back and revisit anything that Senator Bennett said, or if you want to go back and revisit the presentations you're about to see, you can do all of that. Uh, everything is uh, archived at www.esi.org. And if you take the time to visit us online and somehow fail to subscribe for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, that's on you, because it's a really good newsletter. You should all sign up for that. So um, our first speaker today is Katie Lebling. Katie is an associate in WRI's climate program, where she leads research and analysis to inform policy recommendations for scaling carbon removal approaches responsibly at the state, federal, and international levers, uh, levels. Her current work focuses on marine CDR, and if you want to learn more about that, remember we did that briefing earlier in the year, Katie was part of that, international governance of CDR, measurement, reporting, and verification in federal policy design. Before working on CDR, she supported WRI on tracking G greenhouse gas emissions and national climate commitments. Katie, welcome to the lectern. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for being here today. Um, as Dan said, I'm Katie. I'm a research associate at World Resources Institute. We're a global nonprofit research organization and uh, work on a lot of different topics at the intersection of climate change, natural resources, and uh, human development. So I lead our research on carbon dioxide removal and focus on federal policy in the US. Um, so I'm just gonna do kind of an intro presentation, some level setting, so apologies if people are already familiar with some of this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I'm gonna cover some of the basics, why we need carbon dioxide removal, what some of the options are, um, what's, for what's been proposed and tested so far, how much we'll need, and why policy is so critical to this field. Um, so I first wanna start with the question of why do we need carbon dioxide removal? Um, and so when I say carbon removal, I'm referring to technologies and approaches that pull CO2 directly out of the air um, and sequester it durably. So this is different from carbon capture and storage, or CCS, which captures emissions at a source and prevents it from going into the air. Um, so this chart you may have seen before, it's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent report, um, which reaffirmed the need for carbon dioxide removal and the important role that it plays in achieving net zero emissions. And so globally, we'll need to reach net zero CO2 emissions by around 2050, and the U.S. is committed to net zero across all GHG, all greenhouse gases, um, by 2050 as well. So carbon removal is what puts the net in net zero. So along with reducing emissions as much and as fast as possible, We'll also need carbon dioxide removal approaches to counterbalance the remaining or residual emissions that we don't know how to abate. So after we reach net zero, um, as the senator said, carbon removal is the only way we have to remove excess CO2 that's already in the atmosphere, those legacy emissions. And that's what's causing the worsening impacts of climate change that we are seeing today. 
So two things about the um, role of CDR in this chart I want to note. So we can see the biggest portion of um, the mitigation pie is emissions reduction. So CDR plays a really critical role, but it is uh, proportionally smaller than emissions reduction. And it cannot replace emissions reduction. It's needed alongside of them. So carbon removal includes many things, um, many different types of technologies and approaches. And each approach uh, or technology will make sense in different places, under dif different circumstances, and present different benefits and risks. So you can see approaches done on land on the top, ranging from very familiar things like planting trees, um, increasing soil carbon, to more nascent approaches like using, using machines that uh, use chemicals to scrub CO2 directly from there, known as direct air capture. Um, and on the bottom are ocean and marine CDR approaches, which also include a range of options. So, and there are a bunch of different ways to think about how to categorize these. This kind of technological to natural abiotic biotic is not definitive. It's not the only way to think about it, but it can be helpful um, to kind of organize it in your head. Um, so I'm just going to discuss a few of these approaches to give a better sense of how they work, where we are in terms of development, and what some of the challenges are. Um, so the first one, direct air capture, or DAC, um, arguably the most familiar among the kind of novel approaches. So this uses chemicals that selectively react with CO2 and pull it from the air. And then you have to do something with the CO2. So you can either sequester it deep underground for permanent storage, or you can use it in durable materials like concrete uh, that, that also result in permanent storage. So for both of those options, you might also need to transport it uh, via pipeline or some other um, means like truck or uh, barge. And DAC is energy intensive. It requires power to, uh, to power that capture process. Um, and this is ideally uh, renewable or zero carbon energy, sorry, power and heat. Um, and uh, yeah, ideally zero carbon or renewable energy to maximize net negativity. And so there are a handful of these DAC projects um, operational today. The largest in the US is 1,000 tons per year capacity. The largest in the world um, is in Iceland, and that's 36,000 tons. Actually, the photo there um, is from, from Iceland. Um, and then there are several other megaton or million ton scale facilities in progress in the US, um, in part through the Regional Direct Air Capture Hubs program in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Another suite of approaches uh, is known as carbon mineralization. So this includes a bunch of different ways to accelerate natural weathering processes and rocks that uh, remove and sequester CO2 permanently. So certain types of rock can be ground up and spread on crop fields, um, known as enhanced rock weathering, or spread in the ocean, uh, known as ocean alkalinity enhancement. Or it can also be used as a storage option. So you can capture CO2 via DAC and inject it into certain types of rock in the ground where it will mineralize and be permanently sequestered. So one of the main challenges here is logistics, accessing, moving, um, and applying the right kind of rocks in the right places in the most effective way. Um, another, another set of options, so there's a wide range of ocean and marine CDR approaches um, range from, ranging from growing and sinking seaweed to running electricity through seawater to directly extract the CO2. So marine CDR approaches are arguably even newer um, and even less developed than terrestrial approaches. However, there's a growing interest in leveraging the ocean's uh, potential to remove carbon, but at the same time, a lot of uncertainties that require a lot more funding for basic research, basic and applied research to answer. And then lastly, um, in terms of the approaches, biomass-based approaches. So there are a lot of different ways to also use biomass, um, which has taken up CO2 through photosynthesis, um, and then ways to use that biomass to prevent that re-release of CO2 into the atmosphere. So these are collectively known as BIKERS, Biomass Carbon Removal and Storage Processes. Um, so they range from things like directly burying biomass in a way that doesn't um, that prevents it from decomposing, pyrolyzing it into biochar and adding that to soils, pyrolyzing it into bio oil and injecting that into the ground. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. And for any type of biker's approach, um, what type of biomass feedstock is used is really important. So this is because if biomass is grown specifically for CDR, it can take a lot of land area, it can take away from um, other uses for food security, reduce biodiversity, et cetera. So, uh, we like to, to focus on waste and residual biomass, and it's also important, yeah, to consider the full like, life cycle impacts of any biomass used. Okay, so now that we've gone through those approaches, the next question might be, 
how much carbon dioxide removal do we need in the US? Um, the center mentioned roughly a gigaton. So I'm just gonna go through three different reports that have estimated uh, this amount to kind of give a sense of, of that. Um, so the first one, this is from the US Long-Term Strategy, published in 2021, so it's a few years old, um, which charts out pathways to reach the US's commitment of net zero GHGs by 2050. So the last two bars show the modeled contributions of land sink, um, enhancement or the land sink and uh, other carbon dioxide removal technologies. So both are very roughly half a gigaton. You'll see there's kind of fuzzier lines, more uncertainty around the land sink enhancement, but overall very roughly a gigaton. Um, another estimate comes from the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management's 2022 strategic vision, which estimates it in a slightly different way. It goes sector by sector and estimates how much um, what level of emissions by sector would be very hard to abate um, and would need to be compensated by CDR. So they come to roughly 1.3 gigatons, but a lot of uncertainty there. Um, and then the last estimate I'll show, there are more out there, but just picking three, um, is the fifth uh, National Climate, Ass Climate Assessment from 2023, which shows the estimated carbon sink today um, and how much more would be needed by 2050. So the difference there could be as little as half a gigaton if the land sink stays intact at the current level that it is, but it is expected to decline. So the gap could be closer to a gigaton. So then the question is, where are we today? How much carbon dioxide removal is happening? So this chart shows kind of the, the rough range of CDR targets on the right, roughly half a gigaton to roughly 1.4 gigatons, although this is still uncertain. Um, and the kind of current level that we're at today, above and beyond uh, what uh, ongoing removals from the land sink. So in terms of novel CDR, we have less than a million tons of novel uh, removal in the U.S. today, and while this has been increasing over the past several years, the historical kind of trajectory is much lower than the trajectory that we need to be on to meet these goals. Um, so, and it's possible that CDR might grow non-linearly or exponentially, but either way, um, there's a big gap. So, this brings me to the final point, um, which is why policy is so critical for scaling CDR. First, carbon removal is largely a public good. Um, no one, it's something everyone benefits from, but no one has an incentive to pay for. And so along these lines, it does not have a built-in market, unlike other clean technologies like solar PV or electric vehicles, which you need in your life to provide power and transport. No one inherently needs carbon removal to go about their daily lives. So policy is critical to help create both supply and demand for CDR. Um, and and, and this policy, ideally, would support all stages of technology development, from the basic research uh, to the demonstration to deployment um, incentives. So I will stop there and pass it on to Galen. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, that brings up Galen Bauer. Galen leads research at the Rhodium Group focused on advancing emerging clean technologies to reach decarbonization goals. Her areas of expertise include hydrogen, economic impact modeling, and carbon capture and removal. Galen joined Rhodium from Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment, where she taught global climate policy, led a student delegation to the UN climate negotiations. Uh, which one? Oh, cool. Very good. Um, sorry. Uh, and worked with the community in Puerto Rico to develop a solar plus storage microgrid. She has also served as an organizing director for environmental campaigns in Pennsylvania and California. Galen was a lead analyst on the recent report, The Landscapes of, of Landscape of Carbon Dioxide Removal and U.S. Policies to Scale Solutions. Galen, it's great to have you. I'll turn it over to you. Does that work? Um, great, thanks so much for the introduction. Hey everyone, my name is Galen Bauer. I'm a senior analyst at Rhodium Group. Um, and today I'll be giving a presentation based on our recent report that we released this spring, um, The Landscape of Carbon Dioxide Removal and U.S. Policies to Scale Solutions. Um, so just a quick overview of my presentation. First, I'll be discussing the types of policies needed to support CDR, um, and then discussing current U.S. policies and their impacts, and then discussing U.S. policy options to scale CDR. Um, just a disclaimer, this was a really big report, so I only have 10 minutes, so I'll just be talking to the policy highlights here. 
Um, so starting off with policy levers needed to support CDR, these are the four categories of policies I'll be using to frame both current and future policies. Um, each of these categories plays a specific and critical role in scaling CDR. The first is demand side policy. So as Katie said, unlike other decarbonization technologies, CDR does not operate within an existing private market. If anything, it's more similar to waste management. So demand side policy is crucial to establish a reliable revenue market um, that can provide long-term and predictable revenue sources in order to incentivize and cover the costs of CDR. Um, and then also building on Katie's presentation, there are a variety of CDR technologies at various stages of deployment. So for those still in the development phase um, or still in the lab, research and development policy is really important to spur innovation and allow for breakthroughs and cost learning. Then after that, once companies are ready to leave the lab setting, demonstration and deployment policies become extremely important. Um, at the point of demonstration, costs can be at their highest and it's harder to secure financing at this point since there's a greater uh, risk, financial risk associated with unproven processes at scale. So demonstration and deployment policies help com companies transition out of the lab and overcome this financing hurdle. And then lastly, infrastructure and other supportive policies enable the build out and integration of a CDR market. Okay, so moving on to current US CDR policies. Um, the first um, is under the IRA, 45Q tax credits increase to $85 per ton for carbon capture with storage. Um, this can benefit the CDR approach BEX, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And then there's a separate tier for direct air capture, which increased to $180 per ton when, um, when paired with storage. So only BEX and DAC qualify for these two tax credits, but it's really important. Um, also at the federal level, the USDA um, funds programs under the IRA, which support natural solutions. Um, and then low carbon fuel standards, direct air capture can provide compliance credits to LCFSs, which is another source of revenue. And then lastly, um, some states have started, started establishing state procurement targets. Okay. Um, so current research development and dem demonstration policies for CDR. Um, a perfect example of demonstration and deployment policy for CDR is the Regional Direct Air Capture Hubs Program, which includes $3.5 billion in funding from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IAJA, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, um, to develop four direct air capture hubs, which will capture at least one million metric tons of CO2 per year at each. There's also funding in there for other direct air capture projects um, at earlier stages of development as well. Um, okay, and then the IAJ also had a handful of, um, of policies to support um, CDR infrastructure. If you are interested, you should definitely go to our report because it's too much detail for me to outline right now, but it's all in there. Okay, so where does this current policy get us? Um, current policy is not sufficient to get us to that gigaton of CO2 per year that we were discussing earlier. Um, our projections show that current policy gets to us to about 50 million metric tons of policy-driven CDR in 2035. Some key takeaways from this slide is that policy is effective in spurring CDR deployment, um, but we're gonna need a lot more of it to get to the levels that we need. Um, and as of now, these policies primarily support natural CDR solutions and direct air capture, but to reach the scale that we discussed, to reach net zero, it will be important to support a diverse array of CDR solutions. Okay, so some policy options to scale CDR. Um, starting with demand side policy, the first is tax credits. So there's really two options here. One would be making 45Q more inclusive to advance CDR approaches beyond BEX and DAC. Um, the other would be to establish a separate, more inclusive tax credit where the sole focus is CDR um, and therefore encompasses a wider range of CDR technologies. Um, 
There could also be a federal procurement program where the government pays for CDR services, either paying by the ton or simply paying for practices that provide CDR. And then lastly, you could imagine um, regulatory policies such as, such as an economy-wide or sectoral level emission standards that can create compliance markets um, where CDR can, um, can serve as a compliance credit for these policies. Okay, so some examples of research and development policies. Um, R&D programs help approaches that are still in the lab, and then pilot programs will help fuel innovation and spur competition. And then for monitoring, reporting, and verification, MRV, which we'll hear a bit more about in a few presentations, um, there are some startups and organizations stepping into this space to fill this need of MRV, but government support will really be important to catalyze this research. Okay, and then demonstration and deployment policy. Um, so demonstration programs similar to the Regional Direct Air Capture Hubs program for non-DAC approaches would be beneficial. Um, and then loan guarantees, the federal government can provide loan guarantees at a favorable rate compared to the open market to assume a larger part of that financial risk. And then last slide, infrastructure and other supportive policies will also be important. Um, so this includes building upon funding under the IAJA to develop a CO2 storage and transport system. Um, also more states can adopt low carbon fuel standards and procurement programs to complement federal action. And then CDR will require a trained workforce, so occupational training programs will be imperative. And lastly, public education will help garner more support and awareness of the variety of CDR approaches out there. That's all, thanks. Thank you, Galen, and congratulations on the report. Very impressive. That's okay. We have to make room for Peter Saris. Peter is a research assistant professor uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also oversees carbon dioxide removal and carbon capture research at the Clean Energy Conversions Lab. Alongside this role, Peter serves as senior decarbonization engineer at Carbon Direct, a carbon management company. Peter previously held postdoctoral appointments at Stanford and the Colorado School of Mines. We heard that mentioned a little earlier in the area, area of techno-economic life cycle and geospatial assessments of engineered carbon management solutions. Currently, Peter's work focuses on climate change mitigation through carbon capture, utilization, and atmospheric carbon removal via direct air capture and carbon mineralization. Peter's a co-author of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory's recent report, Roads to Removal. Peter, welcome to the briefing today. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say. There you go. All right, it's uh, really exciting to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Pete Saris with Penn and, and Carbon Direct, and I had the wonderful privilege of uh, co-authoring uh, this report under the uh, exceptional leadership of Jennifer Petridge at Lawrence Livermore uh, Roads to Removal, where we kind of looked at uh, what the, the we heard earlier, great potential here in the United States, I think long recognized as, as a leader in CDR policy, but what can you actually do on the ground? Um, and this report follows on a pretty successful uh, analysis we did a few years ago on the state of California, and we, uh, we recognized that uh, the, the insights gained from that type of, of analysis could, could obviously benefit at a, at a national level, obviously a lot more uh, arduous to do, do something like that. So we, we took the same approach, and, and really the question it, you know, that we ask is, given the rising number of CDR technologies, all with different resource demands, energy, land use, water, et cetera, um, and different regions that have different availabilities of these, of these resources. If we can take very granular inventory of those resources, we can, A, can understand from the ground up what is the actual potential for CDR, and interestingly, which of these technologies would be favorable in certain regions and which one. So that was sort of the premise of the report. So it's a long, again, a long report, so I'll do my best to get through some of the insights, but I'll give you a link at the end for you to read, you know, your spare time. Uh, just by the numbers, I think we saw, saw that uh, we need to hit that gigaton mark, and the report affirms that we can, we can do that with our resources and beyond, and I'll get to that beyond in a second. 
but that we predict we can hit 1 billion by 2050. And we could do so at, at a cost of $129 billion. 129 sounds like a lot of money, it is. Uh, it's, it's $129 per ton, that's, you know, in line with what the carbon and negative shot is, is, is aiming for, that $100 per ton target. Just a reminder, NOAA estimated last year in 2023 climate-related damages in the U.S. were $93 billion. So it's, it's a kind of little bit all relative. And importantly, and I think Rhodium Group, another name drop, uh, has done good analysis on, on jobs. We show as well that you can create 440,000 jobs in, in the United States. So CDR can also be an instrument to help kind of offset uh, kind of economic loss. Um, I guess this is an, an important slide. I want to talk a little bit about the roads not traveled in the report. Our, our analysis focused on mature technologies, and we did that for three, uh, three reasons, and, and there may be some, some criticism of, of that approach. You know, we recognize this fortunately wasn't the only road to removal report we'll ever do, uh, and the space is, is uh, fortunately evolving very rapidly. Uh, and so, you know, it took two years, two years or so to do, but we focus mainly on the mature tech, and that would be afforestation, reforestation, improved forest management. Katie's talked about a few of these already. We've talked about soil, so we looked at, at soil carbon management, biochar, and the bikers, and, and direct air capture. And again, the three reasons here are really, I think, first and foremost, data. Uh, we wanted to get down to the county level and really kind of assess, you know, data and make that apples to apples, and it's really hard to con to, to compare many of these up and coming, uh, um, you know, technologies, many that are there now, but weren't at the point where we had to kind of freeze the report. Um, secondly, uh, and, and, and as Laura will get into, uh, the maturity of these technologies isn't just about the, the technologies, but it's also about the support in MMRV, measuring, monitoring, reporting, and verification. And if you don't have that, you don't have a technology. Okay, fundamental to these pathways is that we have the science Okay, and to validate that we're doing what we're saying we're doing. So this really came down to ensuring that we have, we have that in, in place. Uh, and third, and it wasn't uh, maybe a direct motivation for why, why we took mature pathways, but I think there's a lot of focus on innovation, and innovation is a wonderful thing in the space, but I think we ought not forget that a lot of our problems can be solved by existing technologies. And uh, exist, a lot of those existing expertise exist in other sectors, and we need to do a better job of mapping that into CDR and see where we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, so we look across uh, the cost space, and again, that, that, that's one billion tons per year asterisk, and if you can see all the way at the kind of the right-hand side of the supply curve with really tiny fonts, so I'll try to get through this a little bit. That's direct air capture our good old friend there, with a, with, a, with a giant arrow. So we're at one billion, but direct air capture really has enormous potential. It could take us all the way out to 14 billion tons. So we think about the potential here in the United States, not just to hit our goals, but also start to hit the goals of other nations. We need to start thinking about things like Article 6 and international carbon trading. Um, the cost on the left-hand side, from a marginal abatement perspective, we have negative costs in some of our forests, right? So you're getting actually more value out of the wood products and getting negative costs to remove. So obviously we want to seize those, but we ought not think that cheap means cheap in terms of quality, right? We do have quality criteria today, and I think the CDR space in general has taken a, a, a great call to, to heed uh, and, and, and shift into more quality removal, uh, hitting those principles, principles of additionality and durability. So th though these, these, the forestry and some of the nature-based pathways might ha have the durability of the more engineered counterparts, we find that they're really instrumental in, in the near term, particularly from a cost perspective, and getting us to where we need to, to get. If you look down that supply curve, you're going to see a lot in the biomass, right? Uh, biomass to hydrogen, biomass to sustainable aviation fuels. And so what you see is that not only can biomass help us with our CDR goals, but it might be able to help, help us decarbonize other sectors as well. Um, those, those biomass pathways are vast. Again, tiny font. I'll give you the link to the report. Just know that there were 27 pathways and growing that we analyzed. Uh, and biomass is, uh, and, and waste biomass at that is really important uh, a tool here because it's already done the hard part. It's taken that CO2 out of the atmosphere. Really the goal in that engineering is to keep it from going back into the atmosphere. So there's a tremendous amount of intrinsic carbon removal value in that biomass, but there are also other things of value like energy and co-products. We can create sustainable aviation fuel. One of the big outcomes of the report was the amount of hydrogen you can create from biomass. And 
that's really more about creating more carbon dioxide from that biomass than is the hydrogen. That's it's the most, you create more CO2 from any other pathway when you create, when you create that, that uh, um, hydrogen. But whenever you have this great potential, and waste biomass is, is, is tremendous potential in, in the United States, we have to be careful that we're uh, sourcing that sustainably. Right? Anything that was a waste product that now gets economic value, we need to make sure we don't induce economic leakage uh, where people would be being more wasteful or generating waste for the purpose of kind of supplying to that market. Another challenge with the biomass pathway is that it is capital intensive and a lot of these, these pathways have, 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 that, uh, um, have that burden. Um, uh, uh, the other uh, thing that we, we, we um, recognize in, in the biker's pathway is that it, the biomass is also regionally uh, you know, uh, distributed, and so linking those biomass sources with the conversion and the biofineries as well as those end product markets can be a challenge to link those all together. Um, we also studied direct air capture in the report. I talked about the great potential in direct air capture to take CO2 right out of the atmosphere. We focused on, again, the most mature kind of commercial options, but this is a really fastly growing field, and we're, we're, we're thrilled to see that. A lot of great support in that DAC hub uh, uh, program. We're seeing uh, uh, feasibility studies and, and deployment studies going up across the United States. Uh, where are these you know, all, all located? Well, you can see on the map, is there any a trend here? Well, what, where we think about direct air capture, what makes it very interesting is, in theory, you could place it anywhere. You're basically mining the atmosphere for carbon, right? Uh, where you would want to place it is in a region where you've got uh, co-location with storage and, and re uh, good, good uh, uh, deliverable renewable energy and making sure that that is, uh, you know, aligning with all the, all the principles of, 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 of renewable energy d delivery. So we, we saw a great potential kind of in, in, in western Texas and up through the Rockies and those great plains for that uh, direct air capture. Uh, the story broadens a little bit when you look at the tremendous resources we have geologically in the United States for subsurface storage, and they are tremendous. Uh, there's a lot of really uh, affordable storage uh, down, down in, 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 the, in the southern Gulf um, and into the Great Plains, also in the mid Midwest. Um, uh, what we can expand on this, right? This is, again, mature storage. We know that we can store in things like uh, volcanic rocks and basalts. Those are important resources that we also have a lot of that we need to kind of further develop in terms of permitting. And I don't want to end without talking about the most important slide, and that is who lives there? Uh, and are we making sure that we are not burdening communities that have those legacy burdens? Um, uh, the fortunate, I think, outcome of the report and, and the vast amount of options we have at our disposal is we have the flexibility, okay, to kind of come in hand and, and, and meet those community needs. And I think there's community engagement that needs to happen and needs to be robust, but there's social and environmental impact assessments that need to predate that so that these techno technology developers are coming with those risks and, and benefits in hand. Um, every region has a story. I can't get through them all. My time is up. I'll leave this. It's truly an interdisciplinary effort. Uh, and you can read all about it at roadstoremoval.org. Thank you. So, Peter, I take it this is the team that put the report together. This is. Awesome. That's cool. That's a great photo. Um, I have a distinct uh, um, pleasure now of recognizing the best T-shirt award winner <laughs> as well as the Deputy Director of Policy of the Carbon Removal Alliance. In fact, Laura, before I continue with your introduction, you've given me an idea. I think we should do like an annual, like maybe like panelists awards program. We could call them the ECs. And maybe you could be like, we could have like best t-shirt or like best comments or best slides, but t-shirts on point. T -shirts Respect. On point. Yeah. Respect. Yeah, cool. um, as Deputy Director of Policy at the Carbon Removal Alliance, uh, Laura Hatalski builds uh, uh, policy priorities and represents the organization's interests before key players in Washington. Laura joined the organization after nearly 20 years of working at the intersection of policy, advocacy, and politics, including roles with Senators Catherine Cortez Masto and Ron Wyden, as well as the Senate Democratic Policy Communication Center under Senators Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer. Laura has advised candidates around the country as the policy director of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee and is a Hub Project alumna. Laura. Welcome to the panel today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it is good and 
highly triggering uh, being back in the United States Senate. Uh, special, <laughs> special hat tip to um, all of the congressional staff uh, that are in the room. Uh, they're the, the, team, the teamwork that makes the dream work. Uh, special thanks to EESI, WRI for putting this together. Um, and it's just such a delight to be in this room. Um, you know, I'm among recognizing many faces. One of our board members is here. Hello, Andrew. Um, and Ben from Blue Green Alliance. And so many different friends that I've uh, been on coalition calls with. Uh, and just a huge heartfelt thanks uh, to this group of people that are doing their best to build a CDR sector. Um, I am very, very lucky in that I get to partner with the, with the businesses that are doing this on the ground. And um, it is a... A, a, a common saying that I that I use is that it sort of feels like working um, at like Apollo 11 meets Willy Wonka uh, because it is like this incredible level of science that blows my mind every single day um, and at the same time is so earnest uh, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, and for people that, you know, work in climate or have experience in climate, I'm from the Atlantic coast of uh, Northeast Florida, and so I have uh, deep experiences with hurricanes uh, and the climate devastation that that can bring to uh, really ordinary people. Uh, and so I think sometimes working on climate can be really hard uh, and can be really sad. Uh, but what is great about working in, in climate removal, and this is the, the Willy Wonka side of things, um, is that we're earnest as hell about um, solving this solution and being positive. So a heartfelt thanks to everybody in this room that has played their part in that. Um, so let's talk about CDR. Um, you will notice a feature of my slide is that I feature uh, the pictures of our companies often, uh, just because it is so cool to see these things happening in real life. Um, so highly recommend that you do that uh, if you haven't already. Um, if you're congressional staff, I would, I would be happy to orchestrate a visit for you. Um, please be in touch. Uh, we've seen this chart before about what we're trying to do, so I won't belabor the point, but um, as the person that's sort of speaking on behalf of the private sector here, um, I will pause here to say and to make abundantly clear uh, that CDR is not a crutch for avoiding our commitments on, cu on cutting emissions. What we are doing is a different mission entirely, and no one in this room wavers in their commitment for the bulk of what we've talked about, and Katie talked about this in her presentation, and everyone has talked about it, um, is that we have to cut emissions. This has to be done. CDR is not an excuse to, to not do so. Um, so just wanted to make that clear. Uh, this is uh, always a dangerous thing to do, is to uh, refer to an academic's work when you haven't met him. Uh, but Gregory Nemet uh, recently did a study in 2023. Uh, obviously, we talk about a gigaton scale uh, by mid-century, uh, which I think for me is frankly a little bit hard to wrap my head around. Uh, but Dr. Nemet, um, if, you're, if you're watching, I'm so sorry if I butcher your work. Um, but he basically took a look at um, many different technical technological innovations and their pathway to widespread adoption, right? And they sort of all follow this very lovely curve. Um, and, you know, we can sort of impute what we know about the CDR sector uh, and where we're at now and where we hope to go. Um, and so the new number that I'm throwing out there is 25 million tons by 2030, which is very, very soon. Um, and also in Katie's presentation, she noticed that we are noted that we are currently under a million tons a year. So let's get to work. Let's get to work. Uh, how are we going to get there? Um, this is a picture from ARCA, uh, again, another one of our, our members. They're just doing such cool work, y'all. I love it. Um, okay, so this is not exhaustive um, because I am really want to keep it brief, um, but some of the things that we are currently thinking about uh, that are top of mind for us, uh, MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification, uh, procurement, uh, a big piece of the puzzle, and leveling the playing field on tax, which uh, obviously Galen also touched on. Uh, so let's dive in. Uh, MRV. Um, some people feel very passionately about calling it MMRV. Um, I'm indifferent and uh, we'll just stick with MRV. Uh, you know, pulling from our friends at Carbon 180. Is anyone from Carbon 180 in the room? 
Yeah, there they are. I know those guys. Um, thank you for all your work. Um, this is pulling from their definitions of what these different terms mean. Um, I won't read the slide and we'll refer you to their website and the amazing work uh, that uh, they do over at Carbon 180. They've been the bulwark of this. Um, my now current boss, Gianna Amador, is one of the people that started Carbon 180. Uh, so we're huge fans of everything that, they've do, that they do to move the, move the path forward. So hat tip to you guys. Um, but TLDR, this is the process of proving the climate benefit of carbon removal work. Uh, and uh, how is it going? So this, there's another version of this slide, I will admit, that was a lot more crowded um, with many more headlines about, um, I don't know, I guess the technical term is like fraudy fraud fraud uh, in the voluntary carbon market. Um, and, you know, that is a symptom of an underlying problem with how we go about um, MRV in this country. So, um, just, uh, there's many different things I could say about, about, <laughs> about MRV. Also, I will say, before I get into this, um, we're releasing a paper on this next month. Um, so you all are getting a little bit of a sneak peek in some of our initial thoughts uh, and some of the things that we think need to get done. Um, but the, the problems are, are sort of pretty clear and we talked to a lot of experts in the field and people that have firsthand knowledge in this, but um, a lack of authoritative standards body. Um, right now, uh, the current standards get set by registries uh, with no oversight or any expectation of uniformity or cross-communication, um, misaligned incentives. Uh, our friends, friends at WRI have written about this when it comes to MRV, um, but the registries are often paid by um, the credits that they issue, which creates an incentive to over-credit. Um, I'd also note that, you know, like as this industry scales and we're hopefully, knock on wood, get to a trillion dollar industry in our future, everyone involved is gonna have incentives that they want from MRV. Uh, and I am of the opinion, we are of the opinion that immediate action is needed so that as this industry scales, we can keep high integrity at the center of what we do. Uh, there's diverse expectations from buyers and funders. So everything is bespoke. Andrew can tell you that like every single buyer, you're, you're sort of doing like, <laughs> it's like, like therapy casework to get them what they need. Um, and some of this frankly should just be standardized. Um, and uh, lack of transparency and alignment, sort of already mentioned that. And lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, and this is uh, what Pete also mentioned, is that the, the science is rapidly changing, right? And we should be honest about that. Um, but we also need to get a little bit more organized uh, so that we can send signals of transparency, honesty, um, to the market so that uh, we can bring in additional resources to this wonderful thing. Um, why don't I pause here. Um, so how do we sort of propose about going about this? Um, so in the slide before I had these, you know, sort of headlines about um, VCM. Uh, and VCM is, a, it's a bear. Oh my gosh, such a, uh, and a huge thing to tackle. Um, and I know that many people, I'm sure some of whom are in this room, have been working on that for a really long time. That is not the point of our exercise. Um, and it's actually not, it is of course mentioned in our paper because we would be remiss if we didn't uh, mention the implications of MRV and how it ties to the voluntary carbon market. Um, but we're doing, we're doing a sort of different type of exercise uh, and what we're hoping to change. So um, one way to describe the distinctions is sort of jurisdictional. Um, so MRV just sort of undergirds all of these different systems. Uh, what we are talking about um, is something that you could say is science committee jurisdiction, right? While the VCM is, you know, those financial regulators, ag committee, CFTC. Um, obviously, you know, for MRV, this implicates our NDCs. This is EPA, State Department. Um, compliance markets, 
how exciting. Um, you know, like this is um, different jurisdiction, different questions. But what we're sort of um, would like to posit is that um, MRV is basically like credit rating agencies for asset markets, right? Um, except they're evaluating financial credit worthiness and we're evaluating the science. Right, and what we're saying is that the science needs to get organized, needs to get transparent to make this scalable. Um, all right, I'm running low on time. Uh, quick glance at some of uh, the areas that we'll be making recommendations on. Um, it's a really good read. If you, if, if you want more information, please email me. Um, and that was our quick ditty on MRV. Uh, be remiss if I didn't mention next area, procurement. Um, I will leave, leave that to all of you to read, but obviously some really, really important programs um, that uh, the Department of Energy is buying carbon removal, y'all. This is cool. This makes us one of the world's leaders in CDR policy. No other country is doing this. Canada is talking about do it, doing it. They have it as a budget footnote. Um, and we've talked to our counterparts in Canada about their implementation of this. Uh, but this is frankly a program that needs to scale um, and is so important for setting standards um, and modeling best behavior for the private, private sector. Um, and then lastly, leveling the playing field on tax. Hat tip to so many people in this room that have been working on solving this problem. Galen mentioned this, but um, this is from the State of CDR report. I recommend that read. But the little yellow star is the technology that is eligible for 45Q. Um, and we think that that needs to change. Um, and uh, thinking of some of my friends at home, Roger and Anna at the Linden Trust, uh, and many others that have been leaders in this space in terms of fixing this problem. Uh, so those are some of the things that are top of mind for us. Um, thank you for bearing with me in my overly long presentation. That t-shirt gets you an extra minute. I should have told Tim. I should have told our timekeeper. When you wear a good t-shirt, you get an extra minute. All right. Um, well, that brings us to our Q&A. We have actually a good amount of time for Q&A today, which is very cool. Um, we will definitely take uh, questions from the audience. And my, my new friend Josh, one of our summer interns, has our roving microphone. So I'll keep an eye out for the audience. But to get us started and to allow you all to generate some courage to ask your questions, um, I'd like to start by, um, Katie, I'd like to start with you and then we can go down the panel. You know, we were treated today to some comments by Senator Bennett. He had a lot to say. He covered a lot of topics that we didn't maybe talk about quite as much. But, like, I think the agriculture question in particular, I'm glad someone asked that. But um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to kind of reflect on, oh, yeah, I'm not Laura, sorry. Um, um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to reflect on what Senator Bennett had to say and if there's anything in particular you'd like to sort of add to his comments or any additional context. It's a little bit of a free-for-all, but Katie, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so I guess one thing um, he was talking about in terms of the innovation and national security benefits of CDR, which I think is totally agree with, and I don't think anyone touched on this, but like I talked about carbon removal as a public good. I think it's also important to note that like it can provide those benefits around innovation and national security, which we want to keep in the country. It can also be designed, and policy can help us do this, um, design CDR policy in such a way that it provides other benefits besides just carbon removal. So jobs were talked about um, and that, and policy can help do that. Um, and then just some of the interesting, like, approaches that, that do provide these co-benefits and ways to scale that up. So, for example, like enhanced rock weathering on crop fields can help um, and do, uh, improve crop yields. Um, ocean alkalinity enhancement can help reduce ocean acidification. So I think there's interesting ways to design policy in such a way that provides those benefits. And then I know everyone has said this already, but I think it's just so important that the role, the role of CDR in relation to emissions reductions, and we can't think about CDR in a vacuum. How much, like we're all talking about a gigaton, that is dependent on a huge amount of emissions reductions. If we don't do those emissions reductions, we're gonna need to do even more carbon removal to get to net zero. So it's kind of like we don't necessarily want to be reliant on CDR, we have to be because that's where we are today but we can do our best to not be overly reliant on it, not depend on multiple gigatons. So I'll leave it at that. That was great, thank you. Uh, Galen? This thing on? Okay. Um, so building off of what Katie said, something that really stood out to me 
about what the senator said is um, it just makes a lot of sense that he's at, on the agricultural committee and is really interested in CDR. Um, something that I think is so unique and special about this space is just the variety of CDR approaches that there are. And depending on what you're interested in, you can kind of pick and choose um, the CDR approaches that might best benefit your, uh, your community. So as Katie said, enhanced rock weathering can help improve crop yields for, for um, agricultural workers. If I'm not gonna say just transition, but if you are concerned about oil and gas workers, um, you may be interested in bio oil or certain types of um, CDR where you use injection and storage. Um, so it's just a really cool space in the sense that it has those co-benefits that really you can tailor to whatever community you're most interested in. Great, thanks. Peter? Yeah, I, I think I really gravitated toward his comments on the kind of United States being, you know, best best region in the world to deploy carbon dioxide removal, you know, and the, and the excitement around that. Yeah, I think the report uh, and just recognition of the, the vast number of resources we have. This is a very, very large country, but also very diverse in terms of uh, all of the ingredients that you need to hit basically across the board on carbon dioxide removal technologies. Um, and just can't understate how important it is to have that flexibility when, when we want to do this, and I maybe didn't like the word just transition, but you know, we want to focus on responsible deployment and ensuring that you have community engagement, community buy-in, that you are marrying those carbon dioxide removal benefits with the needs of those communities, and you're actually learning that from those communities and not coming and making those decisions without them. So. I think he would have liked your slide, where yeah. there's a lot of stuff in Colorado. He would have liked that one. Great. Laura? Uh, yeah, I'm, well, I was sort of, he, uh, he mentioned American innovation a lot, which I think is um, a pretty standard thing that you hear about the United States. Um, and I was also sort of reflecting that it is this sort of common frame that, you know, like green technologies, uh, and the different roles that regions of the world play, right? And it's America does innovation really well. Europe, they do really good climate policy. And then China eats all of our lunch and scales everything up. Um, but, you know, as of late, um, American policymakers have shown more appetite for, uh, you know, like not, not, not losing that last bit. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm encouraged by you know, the optimism around CDR, but also hoping that um, we don't have to, you know, like try and win the race in the back end. Uh, if, if you can't tell, I'm a huge fan of industrial policy. Uh, and so I'm thinking about how to introduce that into CDR. Great, thanks. All right, uh, we have a question uh, up here in the front. So Josh will bring you the mic and you can ask away. I was kind of hoping that a microphone wouldn't be involved. Um, I'm uh, an intern over on the House side, so I'm curious. Um, you four are very plugged into this industry, and I always find it so interesting that oil and gas, which represents a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of institutional power, isn't interested in technologies like this, isn't interested in renewable energy just because of the market that it represents. So I'm curious as to whether or not any of you four are seeing overtures, um, and maybe Laura, you can speak to this more because you seem to be very plugged into the commercial side of things, seeing any overtures from oil and gas in terms of investment in carbon removal. Great, thanks. Laura, you can go first and then we'll open it up. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the um, larger DAC companies in the United States is Oxy Petroleum spinoff. Um, so, and many of our companies um, uh, have buyers that are in that space. Uh, so it is something that I think there is definite interest in. Um, we've certainly uh, received overtures from, you know, like folks at API. Um, just to underscore what I said before, uh, CDR is not a crutch to avoid decarbonization. Um, but I think, um, you know, <laughs> I think some of this is, uh, you know, like the writing is on the wall. Um, everyone, anyone else would like to comment? And we can go right down the line if you'd like. Sure. I, I, yeah, I was going to mention, mention, you know, uh, Oxy, but, uh, it, you know, the uh, oil, there's obviously, I think, is a delicate issue because of the, of the moral hazard argument, right? Um, and I think we, 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 hear, we hear the moral hazard argument of, of, of kind of license to burn. Um, uh, one, one would think that that would actually compel oil and gas to be more interested. Um, 
Well, we like to focus on, and, and, and the MRV, and, and I should say that I think a lot of the oversight that we need to continue to work on is just kind of making sure that we have enough eyes, and that goes to buyers, and like a lot of the buyers that we see in CDR today, you know, and their stakeholders have very low tolerance for shenanigans, <laughs> for, for lack of a better word. So I think there is at least some indirect way of kind of having some, some watchful eyes in there. But I think it goes back to the point I made in, in my talk is that there are tremendous skill sets in that industry. Uh, subsurface storage, nobody has moved more carbon dioxide uh, uh, than the oil and gas industry. And we, we desperately need that expertise. So I think there's, you know, it, it can be often villainized in, in, in one context, but I think we recognize that there, are, there are people in that industry that we need to leverage those skills in, in, in the carbon dioxide removal industry. All right. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I saw another question uh, right behind you, Josh. Yes, I'd like to ask uh, how a carbon fee, a policy for a carbon fee, might affect CDR. Great, thanks. We'll open that up. Anyone like to talk about carbon fees? Oh, I, I this is briefly chime in. I, I know that um, you know the carbon fee or carbon price, at least in, in our report, was instrumental. Uh, for agriculture, uh, is farmers have to operate on profit, uh, and 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 implementing uh, novel strategies and and de-risking that you know um, uh, can be be very challenging without having that incentive. So I think there's there there are elements of of introducing that 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 price that can be beneficial to to at least you know. At, strategies like, like, like uh, regenerative agri agriculture. But I think we'll see that perhaps also play out in, in, you know, internationally. The EU has an emission trading scheme and California has cap and trade. So I think we see, we see some really interesting uh, opportunities there with, with uh, um, a price on carbon to drive uh, at least a little bit of that demand. Great, thanks. Um, other questions from our audience today? Oh, we're back up here, Josh, with second row. This is like the question corner. Um, I had a question about, I, I, anyone can answer it, but I, I think maybe Galen and, and Peter might have some good insights. So I'm thinking a lot about uh, load growth on the grid, industrial electrification, green hydrogen, data centers and AI. Is In your forecast and your models, do you see... I mean, that has kind of been a, a pretty new development in terms of modeling for the grid. Have you seen in models for the need for CDR any kind of shift away from power heavy like CDR methods towards ones that might require less electrification? Um, and is that something that the industry is thinking about? Go ahead, yeah. yeah, I can go ahead and get started. Um, so, like, such a good question that is so, like, on the nose of what's going on right now. Because it's so new, we haven't um, fully modeled it yet, but we are starting to see that in reality. Um, so, I know that Project Bison in Wyoming, um, they're facing delays because they're not able to secure um, enough renewable clean energy um, just because of all of those demand um, constraints and then also so many other people wanting that same en energy. So I do think that this is something that we didn't totally anticipate when we started looking into direct air capture. Um, when we put out our first report in 2019, um, this is something that we couldn't have anticipated and it's definitely something that we need to be more aware of and it, it's a new um, speed bump in the road for um, energy intensive forms of carbon dioxide removal. Uh, Peter, and then if um, Katie and Laura, if you have anything, please feel free to chime in. Uh, yeah, excellent question. I mean, this, that is this probably one of the most interesting questions in, in kind of life cycle assessment, MRV right now. I'm not sure we understand exactly how to measure that, but we understand that it could be a huge problem. And I think the problem, just to maybe reiterate to, to the room what we're, we're talking about is, you know, if you need renewable energy, for, for a direct air capture facility, for instance, or any high, high, high load facility, and you need that 24 seven, then you're really doing some sort of virtual power purchase agreement where, where you're actually drawing from a grid 
and you have purchased by the renewable energy certificates or some, some uh, you know, uh, it's a, to, to match that in another location. And really we're talking about what is the actual carbon outcome in terms of the load that you place on your local grid versus the renewable energy that is donated. And I think we've, to that grid, and I think we've always operated on the assumption that it'll be a wash, and the analysis that we're seeing is it is not a wash. Uh, and it definitely depends if you're aligning with uh, the principles that are starting to emerge. Uh, I think mostly driven by 45V, is it? With, and hydrogen, right? But we need to recognize that hydrogen and direct air capture are two completely different industries. Uh, they maybe ought, we, I, or we ought to look at different rules and not treat that all under one umbrella. Though I think, you know, temporal matching, um, you know, obviously being deliverable. So if it can be on the same grid, I think you minimize impacts. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks. Laura, go ahead, please. Uh, no, I mean, you should talk to the guy next to you. Um, uh, but one of the solutions that I've been thinking about is behind the meter. Um, and that's something that I think the gentleman to your right uh, probably has thought a lot more deeply about uh, than mine. But uh, what happened with Project Bison is just hugely disheartening, and I doubt it will be the last. Um, Josh, right behind you, we have another question, and then I think we'll We've, we'll do one more. I saw you. We're, we're all right. Hi, y'all. Thanks so much for having us. My name is Nick Yoon from Third Way. Um, I hear a lot about the transfer, the transferability of jobs and skill sets from the oil and gas and how that can really contribute to subsurface injection and sequestration of CO2. That was a lot of big words. Um, I'm curious, you know, we always talk about the transferability of the jobs and skill sets, but, you know, it's hard pressed to get these people making a lot of good money from oil and gas into a very nascent field. At what point do you think the money in this field will be intriguing enough to get people, you know, who are making great money in legacy industries to move to a more nascent one? Is that something that just comes with, you know, the industry scaling up and then there's more money naturally involved or do there have to be other drivers and levers? Uh, great question. Laura? Getting all kinds of questions today. Nick, very nice to see you. Um, I guess I would say anecdotally, I think that's already happening. Um, you know, uh, per, I was on a trip with Ben, who just asked a question. We spent some time together traveling around Wyoming and out west um, to learn about, it was carbon camp and it was great, um, but had plenty of conversations with folks um, that could anecdotally relay folks that were in sort of, you know, like legacy industries that were switching over. Um, so uh, I think that there's probably a jobs analysis thing to do there looking at Galen. Um, but anecdotally, I think we're already hearing that, that, that some of that switch is already happening. Galen, you got called out. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Oh, I just totally agree. I went to that same carbon camp a few years ago, and there were a lot of friends um, from that program who were like studied petroleum and stu were studied geology and those types of things and they're moving into this carbon capture and storage space and CDR space. Um, yeah, I think it's happening. Great, thanks. Uh, and our last question, you're gonna have to go real quick, but you're wearing the name tag, so I know you're a congressional staff person, so that it got you an extra question today. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so in this Congress, one of the hot topics has been permitting reform. Um, and projects like LNG have been criticized because if you build out those plants over their useful life, uh, you're just not sure if we're going to need them by the time you know the 10-year mark is hit. And then we have this capital investment cost that maybe is not helping very much. Um, when we're thinking about scaling up direct air capture technologies, we seem like in a lot of sectors we haven't arrived at kind of the final scalable technology. So how do we start to build out, build out that infrastructure um, and not get caught by having to retrofit or rebuild a plant with a better technology later? How do we create sustainable infrastructure? Thanks. Oh, I saw Laura, you're hovering over the button and then we'll go to you, Pete. Uh, well, the first thing that came to mind for me in response to that is that a lot of these technologies are modular, um, so they're built to just scale, just 
add more fans, rearrange the fans. Um, and then also on sort of like transportation and storage, you know, there are existing programs at DOE, whether it's the loan programs office or the safe program. So it's really about building this sort of cohesive approach between all of these different programs that are designed to, to address the very issue that you're talking about. So I think the tools are there, um, but in terms of uh, lasting things, again, I point you to the man to your right, um, but most of these technologies are modular, um, so they're just designed to build. Yeah, and I would also, I'd, as the, across the value chain, particularly downstream, a lot of that will be agnostic to the direct the, to the technology and and goes beyond direct air capture as well to, to those, those biker solutions right so liquefaction uh, you know whether that's you know, looking at rail or pipeline and then certainly subsurface storage I think that can all, all be semi somewhat agnostic right uh, to the modular aspect I think we're, we're seeing that and I think hopefully that companies are recognizing if you if you're building a direct air capture company today uh, that you're not so completely out of left field. I think innovation is one thing I talked about, maybe perhaps not reinventing the wheel. Uh, great way to drive down costs is uh, standardization and manufacturing. So if you are all kind of looking at the same size contactors and modularization, that could be a nice shortcut there. So I think to your point, no way to kind of predict the future, but what we're seeing is like it's starting con to converge around similar designs and similar ideas. Um, Galen, do you have anything you'd like to add in response or in just in general, any parting thoughts? Um, uh, just that it was really great to be here today. Um, a really great, uh, sorry, I'm not. No, totally you're fine. <laughs> That's great. Sure. Let's get, talk about how great ESI is. We'll, we're recording this. <laughs> um, yeah, thinking about um, speaking to your question, I do think that people are, these companies, they have these pilot facilities, they are taking innovation very seriously and a lot of them are modular. So um, I'm not too worried about getting stuck with stuff that we can't use. I'm worried about not deploying fast enough. And Katie, you get the last word today. Oh, um, yeah, I guess, repeating what has been said by the other three, yeah, modular approaches for DAC, there's kind of two different technologies and the modular approaches, you just build a bunch of different things and stack them up and so it, it's not as capital intensive as like the large uh, liquid solvent DAC systems. But I guess also among all the CDR approaches, I think DAC is probably the, like CapEx to OpEx, the most capital intensive. And there are a lot of approaches that don't require as much upfront infrastructure investment. And so you are less, um, there's less risk of that kind of lock-in of infrastructure that gets innovated beyond. Um, so yeah, I'm not, also not, not too worried about that, um, that risk. Thank you. Um, that was a really great panel, uh, and I think our panelists deserve a round of applause. Thank you very much. And thanks for the great questions. Uh, thanks for the great questions. Um, big thanks to Senator Bennett uh, for joining us at the beginning of the briefing. That was extremely cool. Um, also, big thanks to Senator Welch and his great team uh, for helping us with the room today. Um, we could not have done today's briefing without our friends at the World Resources Institute, so thanks to Katie and Jennifer and Christina uh, for being so much fun to work with uh, and for encouraging us to do this topic. Um, I'd also like to share thanks uh, with my colleagues at ESI who pulled the briefing together and did all the hard work. Uh, Omri, Allison, Dano, and Aaron, who's not with us today, uh, Anna, Molly, Nicole, Tim, Jeff, and we have three summer interns, two of whom are here today. You'll have to come back on September 26th to see Jemiah, but we have Alia and Josh with us today and they were big helpers, so thank you very much. And Troy, our videographer in chief, uh, thank you for helping bring our um, briefing to the world. We will be back uh, on September 26th with the next installment of our, our IRA and IIJA progress report briefing series. And this time we'll be covering funding opportunities for nonprofits, municipalities, and communities. So if you want to learn about Renew America Schools, Renew America's nonprofits, direct pay, other good stuff, that will be a really, really great briefing. I'm really excited about how that's coming together. Um, we also have a ton of great stuff coming up in October. Uh, I'd like to highlight our three-part series uh, about COP29. That's the International Climate Negotiations, and they'll be in Azerbaijan this year in November. We're going to have three briefings on October 23rd, 24th, and 25th. One is going to be called the U.S.-China Relationship and in International Climate Diplomacy. One is going to be called, methane, or is called, Methane Mitigation on the 
global stage. And our popular What's on the Table for the Negotiations will be the third of those briefings. So visit us online, sign up for Climate Change Solutions, our bi-weekly newsletter, and RSVP for those. You're going to be hearing a lot about what's happening in Azerbaijan this year, and those COP briefings are going to be really cool. And another plug for climate change solutions. Um, if you have a moment, um, I always forget this slide, but I remembered it today. Um, if you have a moment um, to take our online survey to tell us about what you thought of today's briefing, if you're in our online audience, if you had any tech issues, if you have any ideas for future topics, it only takes two minutes and we read every response. We really appreciate everyone's willingness to uh, help us out with that. But um, thank you so much to Katie and Galen and Peter and Laura for being great panelists. Uh, and we will be back here in two weeks or so, uh, two weeks, uh, for our IIJA and IRA progress report briefings. So have a great afternoon, everyone. Enjoy the nice weather. Thank you. Thank you.